they exploited Toby. They exploited him and made him a weapon against his own community to destroy the trans community, the community that he's a part of. And now they're doing it with countless detransitioners. And they're using these stories, crafting them behind closed doors with the same people that are drafting the anti-trans legislation that's, po that's popping up all around the country. It's being drafted by a team of conservative Christian, Christo-fascists, and TERFs. And so the next time that a TERF tells you that the Nazis aren't welcome at their, part, at their rallies, just remember, you know, that may be true. Maybe they aren't strictly speaking welcome at the rallies. Eleven House in Victoria. Though I the doubt that very much. They sure seem to be welcome to me. Maybe they are unwelcome at the rallies, but you know what? They are welcome. They're welcome at the meetings behind closed doors. All right, I think we're good now. So. There was a big turf rally in Melbourne. And uh, like all turf rallies, some fucking Nazis showed up. Now normally, the Nazis that show up at turf, at turf rallies are just the turfs themselves. You know, and they would, they would never admit it, but that's of course what they are. However, this time, some real card-carrying motherfuckers showed up. Some, uh, some real Nazis, some goose-stepping motherfuckers. And uh, the media kind of tried to cover it up. And uh, a lot of folks are still trying to cover it up. And TikTok keeps deleting uh, the video evidence that counters the narrative that the TERFs are pushing. You see, the TERFs said, hey, we didn't know anything about these Nazis. We, we didn't expect them to be there. We didn't really want them there. And uh, in fact, what they said was pretty sickening. What they said was, we can't be expected, us weak women can't be expected to remove these Nazi men from our presence. Well... Interesting, uh, interesting story about that. You see, there, there was a lot of trans uh, supporters, supporters of trans rights, rather, I should say, that were counter-protesting the event. And when they saw these Nazis, they did their damnedest to get rid of them. They, they pushed forward. They tried to get rid of these motherfuckers. And to be clear, these assholes were, like, displaying swastikas and doing Nazi salutes and shit in broad daylight, right? Bad shit. So the trans rights side tried to get rid of them. The TERFs did nothing to get rid of them. And, of course, they were there in support of the TERFs. If you don't believe me, let's just fucking watch. Yep, that's me. I bet you're wondering how I got in this situation. This is Lila HRPG. Go follow her. She has a lot more followers than we do, but you know, she is doing some extremely great work, so I don't mind plugging her. And uh, thankfully, she brought us this video, which as far as I'm aware, this is the only like really good video that shows the details of what happened on that day. Mm. Well, I want to go stand for trans rights against a career transphobe with severe links to the far right, only to turn the corner and see literal Nazis doing fucking Nazi salutes at Parliament House in Victoria. The literal fucking Nazis also did these Nazi salutes and chants on the steps of Parliament House in Victoria. We turned the corner and saw the see, Nazis and came rushing in like it was first light on the fifth day at Harmony's Deep. So as... So as you can see, the trans rights supporters are trying to move in and get rid of the Nazis. The police are protecting them. Look at all these lovely perks standing right next to you as you're Nazi, doing Nazi salutes on the Parliament steps. Love that destroy pedo freak sign. That's really lovely. The literal Nazis were not there to support them when the sign that they brought is exactly the same rhetoric that was said just a couple of days ago by one of the literal organizers of this event. One of the organizers who is on Twitter right now defending Nazi presence at this event. Just in case you needed any proof, event by Angela Jones. Angela Jones. Angela Jones. Angie is a prominent Australian turf and is well known within the community and I've made videos about her before, even some as frequent as a couple of days ago. There were Nazis on the steps of Parliament House of Victoria and the police did not stop them from parading around or doing Nazi salutes. In fact, they were too busy roughhousing trans protesters to care about the literal parade that the Nazis were throwing at Parliament House. The TERFs were more than happy to have the protection of the Nazis and stood alongside them and did not do a single <laughs> thing to remove the Nazis from the event. The Victorian Liberal Party came out condemning the presence of neo-Nazis at Parliament House today. 
but had nothing to say about the fact that one of their upper house MPs actually was in attendance of this event, standing alongside those same Nazis. Getting chummy with Angie Jones. I have videos. I'm fucking exhausted, it's been a day, so I'm going to get some rest before making any more videos about today. But I just wanted people to know that there were literal Nazis at Parliament House today doing Nazi salutes, and the police did nothing to stop them, and in fact, protected them. And these Nazis came specifically to support the TERF movement, the movement that was also funded by the CPAC network. It's time people start calling this what it truly is. All right. So that's what happened that day. So, now that we have that context, we can get into the meat of what we're really here to talk about today. If you'll bear with me while I pull it up. But we needed that. That's the perfect framing device. That shows us exactly what's at stake. It shows us who our enemy is. Now that we know who our enemy is, now that we understand the character of, en of our enemy, Let's see what our enemies have been up to. We've got two stories to go over. We may just do one. It depends on how much time that we have. We'll start with this one. All right. So this article is from Pink News, and the title, as you can see, Proud, Proud Trans Man Who Once Detransitioned Blasts Fascist Turf Group for Exploiting Him. So let's learn more about this. Let's learn more about Toby Tick here. Uh, he was one of the tr detransitioners that spoke out against the evils of the transgender movement that was grooming and exploiting children. Uh, but it turned out the story was a lot different than the one that we got. Three years ago, trans non-binary man Toby Pick was speaking at an anti-trans event against gender-affirming healthcare in the UK. Toby, who wants to detransition, tells Pink News he was angry at the time with his experience of trans healthcare in the UK and believes he was, quote, exploited by turf groups who he says are no different than fascists. I don't know why fascists is in quotes. The narrative of gender-critical detransitioners is one of the most damaging things that has ever come out of the anti-trans stuff, he says. In 2020, a detransitioner, backed by various so-called gender-critical groups, won a court case which stopped the prescription of puberty blockers to trans youth under the age of 18, or 16, rather. So, um, in case, I'm sure that most of you are aware, but just in case, a detransitioner is somebody who decides that after they've started their transition, their gender transition, that uh, transition is not right for them, that they would rather, or rather, perhaps they feel forced to, in, in many cases, um, live life, um, presenting as their gender assigned at birth. That's what a detransitioner is. Most detransitioners do it for like safety reasons or because they're being um, just relentlessly harassed and bullied and that sort of thing. Some detransitioners do it because they realize that transition just isn't a good option for them um, and they, they feel that they made a mistake. Um, and detransitioners are part of our community. They're part of the trans community. We should embrace them as such and we should take care of each other. Um, detransitioners and uh, trans folk alike. Hmm. However, back in 2020, uh, the TERFs in the UK used the case of Toby Pick here um, to essentially make it to, to ban the use of puberty blockers uh, for people under the age of 16 in the UK. And that's very serious. Obviously, the purpose of puberty blockers is to prevent um, a puberty that would do damage to you, to prevent puberty um, that is not congruent with your gender identity. If you have to wait until you're 16, that defeats much of the purpose of the puberty blockers. Um, and uh, what happens when trans folk do not receive the health care that they, that they need and that they deserve? Well, studies have shown that it increases their rates of depression, their, or their, excuse me, it increases the symptoms of their depression and anxiety and suicidal ideation. So yet another action taken by the TERFs to kill more trans people was successful, of course, in the UK. Thankfully, as we read in the next sentence, it was later overturned. Today, or Toby, rather, who's 23, uses he, him pronouns, has had a more complicated coming out story than most. He first transitioned socially, then trans, excuse me, then detransitioned, 
and came out as a lesbian. I don't know what connection that has to uh, the gender identity. I guess you can't say that you're a lesbian if you're a man. Fair enough. Beca uh, became a self-described turf, then came out as trans for a second time and has since undergone top surgery. Um, I believe that we get to see some photos actually later on. TERF stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminist and is used to describe someone who excludes all support for trans women from their advocacy of women's rights. If you ever hear someone refer to themselves as gender critical or as a gender critical feminist, you are speaking with the TERF. You're speaking with a fascist. So now you know. Uh, when Toby was working with anti-trans groups, his anger toward gender-affirming health care was made to feel valid by those he was involved with. He says, my whole processing of my transition and detransition had the turfy lens on it before I even had a chance uh, to separate any of my own feelings, Toby says, referring to his time in so-called women's groups. Toby first questioned if he could be non-binary when he turned 16 in early 2016, or when he turned 16 in early 2016, that's hard to say. Uh, but later that year, decided he was a trans and non-binary man and came out to his parents. Good job. That's some king shit right there. Initially, he legally changed his name to Percy in 2017, but has since changed it to Toby. The 23-year-old, I'll leave that picture right here. The 23-year-old fell in with what he now describes as hateful groups, and he was referred to Nottingham Center for Transgender Healthcare in 2017, but failed to get the treatment he needed. By 2019, and still without treatment, Toby had, become, had, had come out as a lesbian and became involved in the TERF movement. So this appears, is this the old Toby? Yeah, this is, this is the old Toby. Stop trans, transing lesbians, female heterosexuals. Wild shit. It's a good thing he's on our side again. I'm glad to hear, I'm glad to see it. Though, though really he was never against us, as we will find out. At least, I mean, I suppose he personally harbored uh, ill feelings towards the trans community and towards gender affirming care. Uh, but he was never quite as on board, uh, as it was made out to be, and, uh, yeah, he feels very used and exploited by this movement, and we'll see why in a moment. He tells Pink News he feels TERFs exploited people who are struggling with complicated issues. The point is that you've got somebody there with serious complications, issues, or trauma, and they're being exploited by people who want to use that to promote their hateful campaign to eradicate a group of people. I mean, it's messed up as best. And that's something that's important to remember, too, is that when we have these detransitioners that are um, taking actions against this community, they're taking actions against their own community. They're taking actions that actually harm themselves. So there's definitely, uh, you know, hatred involved there. But they are about as much victims as the rest of us in all of this. Toby recalls becoming more and more hateful as he was continually contacted by media to talk about anti-trans views. He says, when I started out, it, I didn't have any opinions on trans, then it sort of got into this. Once you get into it, it gets more extreme. It becomes, oh well, all trans people are evil and they shouldn't exist. Then forming ideas about, oh, trans people don't really exist in the first place. It um Toby takes a minute to reflect, then admits he used to argue and misgender people deliberately and aggressively on Twitter, quote, just to prove a point. Rough stuff. People eat it up because it's comfor conf comforting in a morbid way. That's not a word that I use very often, comforting. Attack what you don't understand, exactly. And, you know, part of why I find Toby Pick's story so interesting and I'm so grateful that he is where that he is where he is in his life right now is because I have a similar story. I was never a detransitioner, um, but you know I've been trans and I was in denial about it for a long time. And for part of that time, when I was in denial about it, um, I actively took actions against the trans community. I was an activist. I was a um, you know I would I would say that I was a pro-family activist. In reality, what that meant though was that I was like campaigning against the rights of gay people and trans people and that sort of thing. Um, so it's a good thing that, that there is a path to redemption, and I'm very glad to see that Toby is walking it. Um, the COVID-19 pan pandemic saw Toby's participation with the groups grind to a halt due to no gatherings being allowed to take place. Looking back at his 19-year-old self, he feels he was just a child and can recall a lot of the women surrounding him being a lot older. 
that's another thing too is that a lot of the a lot of the turf movement is made up of older um older queer women um and uh yeah there's definitely this vibe of of older women preying on 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 younger folks and exploiting them for political purposes um i now look back and think what was i doing <laughs> tell me about it bro i feel you Toby says being let down by a bad healthcare system played a part in his struggle to find his true self, self for more than a decade. I, he says, I was angry at the gender identity clinic and I was angry at trans everything. I had anger in me, so it made sense when I'm talking to these people, uh, gender critics, also known as TERFs, saying these things and they are validating that it's horrible. According to NHS st statistics, mm, excuse me, as of May 2022, there were 11,407 people on his gender identity waiting list, with the appointments now being offered to people who were first referred in January of 2018. Toby recalls the healthcare process casting a lot of judgment around being non-binary at the time. You know, um, I like to hope that here in the U.S. that we've moved past the, uh, I don't know what you would put it, envy-phobia. Um, the, uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, a lot of trans healthcare providers that don't normally have a hard time at all, like prescribing hormones and that sort of thing to adults who are trans, if they don't fit the gender binary, the way they're expected to, they sometimes do not provide those prescriptions or, and, and withhold them because they don't respect non-binary identities. It's definitely something that I see in here in the U S I personally experienced something similar when I, um, I asked my nurse, I said, uh, when I was first starting, I said, I, I would like to start mo monohormone therapy. I just want to take estradiol. I don't want to take progesterone. And they said no. They said if you don't want to take progesterone, uh, you, should, you should question whether or not you should be taking these drugs in the first place. Uh, it was crazy. I could not believe the shit that I was fucking hearing. Um, and I had, just had to go along with their plan because that was the only option I could get. They were the only people that I could afford. And... Um, and now, thankfully, that is the regiment that I prefer, and I would have arrived at that on my own, I'm sure, but I wasn't given that opportunity. I was just told what to do. Um, so, yeah, cool stuff. And I imagine a lot of other folks go through that, too. Um, now, having had top surgery in September last year, he is on his way to finding his true, se true self. But he reveals he has, quote, had to undo a lot of fear. Mm, me, too put into his head by the groups he found himself involved in. And that fear still pops up. It never really goes away, especially if it, if it's, um, if it was instilled through like religion and there's like religious trauma surrounding it, there's still always a little bit of fear left in the back of your mind. You never, you can never quite get rid of it. So that's something to think about. You know, I know a lot of, uh, I have a lot of friends who are having kids these days and a lot of them are like going back to church because they want to bring their kids to church. Um, well, the ideas that were put in my head from a very young age when I went to church are still doing harm to me this day. So just be very careful about what, ex what you're exposing your children to. And here's a picture post-top surgery. Looking good. He pins a lot of his past confusion on a bad medical care experience. You can start to resent being shoved down a certain pathway. Exactly. Just like I was taught, I was shoved down a certain pathway. It turned out to be the right pathway for me, but I was very frustrated that I wasn't allowed to explore and discover that path on my own. There's too much gatekeeping. I wasn't getting where I needed to be, and in other ways there isn't enough support. He compares some in radical groups he was once part, part of to fascists and says they believe trans people are changing themselves to fit an idea to be some, something else, but we're just aligning with ourselves. Exactly. It's no different than me getting covered in tattoos. Um, sort of, except I think that there's actually kind of more to it than that. Um, I don't know. I don't have tattoos, so I guess I, I'm speaking from a place of inexperience. Uh, but I feel like when you get a tattoo, it's like something like to commemorate it, an event or a person to something that's, or it's something that's just really meaningful to you or just even just nice art that you like to have on your body. Um, whereas at least for me, gender transition is that fundamentally, I am not what society says I am. I am just simply not a man. Um, and all of the changes that come with gender transition have brought me more in line with who I truly am. 
Um, so to me, that's a little bit different. But I guess I can kind of understand what he's saying there. And there's a discussion to be had about that. Tattoos are something Toby has used himself to express his own journey. Uh, of the few he has, he had one done in 2018 of his former pronouns, which he covered up a year later, and a neck tattoo saying valid. So many people had bad experiences medically, which is a case of bad medical care for the system not being set up correctly. I would have liked to be listened to more and not feel I had to pretend to prove something. Goes exactly to what I'm saying. Hold up, gotta fix my headphones. <laughs> Toby says his, I his identity today is still a work in progress. Hey, it's true, it's true for everybody, I'm sure. A lot of people, uh, a, lo a lot of trans folk, you know, our identities change over time because all that we know for sure early on is that our, our identity does not match the one assigned at birth. It's easy to tell what's wrong. It's hard to tell what's right for you. So like a lot of folks will start off, say, um, transitioning as a transgender woman because they just know, like, I'm not a man. And then over time, as they get to explore their identity more and explore gender more, they, sa they say, oh, well, you know, really, I'm non-binary. It's not that I was a woman. It's that I, it was very clear to me that I was not a man. And they began identifying as non-binary. It's an extremely common thing to happen. It's not surprising. Like I said, it's easy to tell when something is wrong, but it's hard to tell what would be right, what would be the solution to the problem. That takes time. I sort of downplayed how hard being trans was. You've got a life of constantly having to prove yourself and more justify and explain yourself, he adds. I've always, had, I've always been terrified of dying, but I wanted to live in a way where I was comfortable and existing in a way that made me want to exist. And that's the end of the article. I wanted to live in a way where I was comfortable and existing in a, in a way that made me want to exist. In other words, he really didn't want to exist before transition. And transi transition enables him to want to continue living. But that's not what the Turks want. The Turks don't want us to continue living. And so they exploited this man, weaponized him against his own community, and just wrecked a portion of his life. But that's what Turks do, you see. You may think this is an isolated incident, but it's not. Not isolated at all. In fact... It's extremely common. Elisa Ray Shoup was a weapon in the hands of turfs and Christian conservatives. Now over 2,600 pages of leaked emails helped tell her story. The making of a detransitioner. This is from Extra Magazine. This article is very long, so we may not go through it all. Considering we just went through a very long article, and my, and my voice says, was already trying to give out before I started streaming today, but that's okay. We will at least get the gist of it because this is very important. Uh, that what happened to Toby was bad, uh, but this article and the story overall is just a little aperitif compared to what's going on here because this article uh, exposes the exploitation of a lot of detransitioners at the hands of the turf movement. Uh, with receipts. That's not saying that, that Toby's story, to, sto story is any less valid or important. It's not. Uh, but rather, I guess what I'm trying to say is Toby uh, is one example, and this article provides many, many more examples. So I will be linking all of these articles um, and the video that we just watched. Well, I guess I can't link the video that, I, that we just watched because it it's being deleted. Um, but I will link these articles in the description below if you want to check them out. Uh, this, this article is just a very, very good resource to have. <clears throat> On Wednesday, March 8th, Mother Jones broke the news of a secret working group that had collaborated to craft anti-trans legislation targeting youth health care and spread it to multiple states. The existence of that group, which included numerous elected officials, members of Christian conservative policy groups such as the Family Policy Alliance and the Alliance Defending Freedom, and representatives from anti-trans feminist group uh, Women's Liberation Front, WOLF, 
among others, proved that the current onslaught of anti-trans legislation was the result of a coordinated campaign within hours of, uh, of a coordinated campaign. Within hours of the Mother Jones story publishing, a 2,600-page PDF archive of car, car, I'm sorry, guys. <clears throat> Did you all know that I'm autistic and I'm terrible at speaking words? It's true. Within hours of the Mother Jones story publishing, a 2,600-page PDF archive of the leaks was posted and online. <laughs> I also have a hard time reading quickly, and I'm trying to do both at the same time. And I have a hard time being in front of bright lights, and I'm looking at a fucking white screen, and I have a light in front of me. So I appreciate your guys' patience. That archive is substantial and is damning, but the public leaks are not the whole story. When the archive was posted, I had already been reading through the leaked emails for several days. The leaker, a trans woman and former detransition activist named Elisa Ray Shoup, had reached out to me to offer access, and I had come away with a whole other story. So, to summarize... There was a, uh, it was leaked that a secret group of anti-trans legislatures, so-called TERF groups, you popped up on my FYP page, oh, wonderful. So a, a secret cabal of TERF groups and Christian conservatives have been crafting the anti-trans bills that have been coming out all over the country this year. Uh, so if you've been wondering why they seem so similar and why their tactics are so dangerous and deadly, this is why. Because the uh, Christo fascists and the TERFs, the feminist fascists, are now working together. Isn't that wonderful? And this document uh, details how they are how they're using and exploiting detransitioners to advance that agenda, as we will see. The full archive sent to me and other journalists contains every email Shoop sent or received from both of her two email accounts between 2017 and 2023 the years when she was most active as a member of the organized anti-trans movement. There are years of media, legislative, and tactical strategy outlined in those emails. There are conversations in which some of the most well-known TERFs in the movement coordinate strategy and brainstorm talking points. It is a playbook of how anti-trans organizations operate and, and a compressed history of how the TERF movement joined forces with the Christian right to create the current movement. So you guys remember when we were watching this video? Let's bring it back up. Give me a second. So you guys remember when we were watching this video, and there was a bunch of Nazis at this turf rally, and the turf said, hey, 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 they're not really with us. We would get rid of them if we wanted to. We're not really on the side of the fascists. That's what they said about it, about it right? Well... Turns out that's not the case. Turns out they've been meeting in secret behind closed doors for years, working together, plotting, crafting anti-trans legislation. So the idea that the Turks and Nazis are not on the same side has been blown wide out of the water. There is no cover for them to hide behind anymore because we have documentation. Most important is the record of how Elisa Ray Shoup was crafted into a weapon, how her narrative was established, edited, and eventually taken out of her control, even as her name appeared on testimonies, Supreme Court briefings, and highly circulated op-eds. This is the making of a detransitioner. More, more like her are being made every day. So we're not going to go through this whole article because it's very long, but it details a lot of what happened to Shoup, how Shoup was used and exploited by the turf movement, to destroy our community, to destroy Shoop's community, the one that she's a part of. And this might sound like a new thing, but actually the right's been doing this for a very, very long time. Let's look at that. The story of Jane Roe who fought for and then against abortion rights. So the Jane Roe in Roe v. Wade, the court case that legalized, um, that legalized abortion choice across this country, uh, the woman who was the Roe, who was the plaintiff uh, in that case, her name is Norma McCorvey. And uh, let's see if we can find this part of the article.
Yeah, her name is Norma Corvey. Oh my God, stop this shit. Well, we aren't going to find the exact right part, but essentially, at some point, Norma McCorvey uh, fell in with the with the pro the pro life, the anti abortion movement. Um, she met a particularly nasty uh, evangelical hate preacher. Um, God, I can't remember his name. I wish I recalled it. Oh, Flip Benham. Flip Benham is who it was. She encountered Flip Benham, became friends with him, and Flip eventually brought her into his organization. Yeah, here it is. Then in 1995, she's working at an abortion clinic in Texas. And as is the way often of people who oppose abortion, they set up shop right next to an abortion clinic, setting up what they call a crisis pregnancy center. The man there was Flip Benham. He was an evangelical minister who was actually the head of anti-abortion rights organization Operation Rescue. He integrates himself to Norma. He befriends her as much as the pro-choice movement is sort of pushing her away. So uh, another element of this story that's kind of interesting is um, the people that brought the case to the Supreme Court, uh, they essentially restricted her access to an abortion while she was pregnant in order to keep her pregnant so that the court case could go forward. It's pretty fucking gross. It's extremely fucked up. Um, earlier in the article, they talk about this. So uh, again, I'll link this article in the description if you want to read about that. It's really an incredible story. It's something that a lot of people don't know about. And then this poor woman goes from being exploited by that movement to being exploited by the, by the anti-abortion movement. Um, he wants to sort of hug her and hold her. This is talking about Flip Benham. He wants to sort of hug her and hold her close, and she then decides to flip. She switches sides. As one of the heads of the pro-life community put it in Texas, the poster child jumped off the poster. But just as Norma didn't feel at home on the pro-choice side, she doesn't feel at home on the pro-life side either because they're exploiting her too. And one big, big problem is that they basically tell her that she can't be gay. She has to renounce her homosexuality. And this causes her untold grief and suffering. Yeah. Uh, I met Norma McCorvey a couple of times. And uh, one of the times that, w that I met her, uh, she discussed... I, I don't remember the exact details... But the issue of homosexuality came up, and uh, it, was when the, it was when she was still involved in the anti-abortion movement, and uh, it, it was a point of pain. You could see it on her face. It was really awful. Um, but yeah, so this isn't anything new. The pro-lifers exploited Norman McCorvey in order to restrict abortion rights, exploited a woman to, 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 harm, uh, to harm all women everywhere. They exploited Toby. They exploited him and made him a weapon against his own community to destroy the trans community, the community that he's a part of. And now they're doing it with countless detransitioners. And they're using these stories, cracking them behind closed doors with the same people that are drafting the anti-trans legislation that's, po that's popping up all around the country. It's being drafted by a team of conservative Christian, Christo-fascists, and TERFs. And so the next time that a turf tells you that the Nazis aren't welcome at their part at their rallies, just remember, you know, that may be true. Maybe they aren't strictly speaking welcome at the rallies. Parliament House in Victoria. Though I doubt that very much. They sure seem to be welcome to me. Maybe they are unwelcome at the rallies, but you know what they are welcome? They're welcome at the meetings behind closed doors where they're actually drafting policies where they're drafting laws that are actually being put into place and are killing trans people. So, we were talking earlier at the very beginning about what a TERF actually is. Well, a TERF is two things. A TERF is a gender critical feminist. In other words, somebody who excludes trans people. But a TERF is also a fascist. That's all I got in.